I'm here at the CXE Open House, and there have been a lot of great guests here, and I have the distinct pleasure of being here with Tommy Kendall. Thank you for joining me here today. Pleasure. And for those of you out there who don't know, Tommy Kendall is a longtime racer, longtime game show, well, not game show, host, a TV host and uh, MC a mini a party and uh, I've seen you around and you seem to be getting sucked into sim racing more and more over the years. Well, it's, uh, I, I mean, I just, I love all facets of it and I was fortunate enough, I was the host, or one of the judges actually, I guess, of uh, GT Academy, first season of the US uh, right. GT Academy. Uh, and it's funny, that, that was a great show because the premise is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Can people that have done only sim racing right. uh, actually compete and so, Obviously, it's hard to find someone that's done zero driving, but they worked really hard to, to limit it, and there were certain criteria. Right. So I got to see it firsthand and see how it played out. It was fun. So that was what was that like? I mean, most of your life, you've been around real racers and maybe some young ones and watching them come through the ranks. What's it like seeing somebody really maybe has no business being on the track, or maybe that's the wrong wording, hasn't been on the track before, but watching them make that leap from sim racing to real life, I mean, are they at an advantage? What's that Well, like? it was interesting because you had some people that had done a fair amount of driving, not actually competing, and the guy that ultimately won uh, had done a lot of autocrossing. Right, never, Brian, Brian Heitkotter. Brian Heitkotter had never run wheel to wheel before. He had a kid, uh, Philip, that ha had done years of karting, uh -huh. and so I figure he's gonna win. He had trouble translating to the non-cart stuff. Right. Some, a couple of the guys, the gamers, that had literally done no real-world driving, a couple of them really adapted quickly. So it was interesting to see. It's all important, and I don't think you can be purely theoretical or sim, as, even though that's getting closer and closer to reality. Uh, I, I think that the rate of improvement of, of sim racers when they get into a real car is there's no way to explain how quickly they adapt other than that it's it's quite helpful. Right. There's a missing, the, the sort of internal gyro right. that gathers information for you that you uh -huh. don't get in a sim, you just can't. Right. You've got motion sims, obviously, here at sure, CXC, sure. but you can't generate G-force, really. Right. And so the ones that are able to sort of calibrate that in with the parts that sims do so well, the visual and the hand-eye coordination and the feel and all that, those ones, a couple of them could do that, and they 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 prosper. And then the ones who excel. Yeah. Um, what about like the look on the faces? I mean, could you tell some of the guys maybe weren't even comfortable being in the car? I mean, come, again, from sim racing, they have no experience, and it's different being in a real car. Yeah, well, I, I remember when I was starting out in the real car world. I mean, you're so nervous, and you're you know you're your own worst enemy in that way, and your mind works on you. And so, in some ways, the guys that had done none were almost not as much of a disadvantage, you know, because they, they really didn't, they had nothing to compare it to. It was just right. thrown at the deep end. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I felt for them, but uh, it, was, it was a really cool sort of uh, social experiment. So, right. And in terms of just seeing how, how it worked out. And the ones that we thought were gonna, you know, if, if you were to handicap it, most people were wrong. I picked Brian out pretty early on. Right. And that, that having a lot of experience with weight transfer and some of that stuff, even though he hadn't raced wheel to wheel, uh, ultimately, you know, I, I picked, they, they wanted to send him, my, a couple of my cohort judges wanted to send him home pretty early and I said, he's gonna win this whole thing. Right. And, uh, and Liz said, no, no, he's, he's, I said, well, obviously there's three votes here. Right. And uh, I, I vote to keep him around and I think he's gonna win the whole thing. Right, so in his case, he had really good car handling. He just needed that wheel to wheel, which he probably had a fair amount of experience online sim racing, getting some of that, but it's a little different in a real car. Well, he was also, his qualifying score, he, was, he won the, the uh, sim portion by a fair margin. He was number one by a fair margin right. in the sim world as well. Right. And whether it would have turned out the same had they raced on a, a different day, I, you know, obviously. Uh, but he, he was number one coming in seed from a sim. He had some real world driving, although never racing wheel to wheel. Right. And what, what's been interesting to watch with him since is confidence is a big part of that. And he didn't have a lot of personal kind of confidence. Right. And you see that with in the, in the real racing world where people have all the skills and when the light bulb finally goes on, they finally win a race or whatever, then they win a bunch in a row. Right. And so that's a whole nother piece of the puzzle. Right, getting which, over that plateau. Yeah, yeah. Okay. thinking of yourself as I'm, a, I'm, I'm as good as these guys around. I remember right. going through that 
as you work your way up through the ranks, you win at this level and you're like, yeah, but I couldn't win at that level. Then all of a sudden you win at that level and it's, you're like, wow. Right. And you're like, but I couldn't win at that level. Right. And then pretty soon you're, you're there. And that's something kind of hard to teach, confidence boosting techniques, yeah. I guess. Um, you mentioned the Carters had kind of a tough time transferring to their real car, or a few of them. Um, do you think that maybe, I mean, any kind of car has its qualities. Do you think that maybe there could be bad habits developed through karting or even bad habits developed through sim racing? Uh, no, without a doubt. I mean, I have a bad habit. I haven't done a lot of sim racing, but I've done, you know, uh, just some, you know, PlayStation stuff. The, the worst habit there is reset. Right, you know? yeah. Like, for example, I know the first half of the Nordschleife a lot better than I know the second half. <laughs> from, of the Nord from resetting. You've seen it twice as many I've times. I've seen it twice at least. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think the, uh, you have to be careful. The, if you've only done one thing, it becomes so second nature, you're not, you're not thinking and you're not improving, you're not as conscious of, and I think the more different stuff you do, you're, 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 you're having to sort of figure stuff out. When it gets to totally second nature, that's helpful in some ways, but it's also, if, if you've done it from a really young age like Carter's, they become a, a natural at it without even really, and they don't think about it, and right. at every step along the way, you need to be able to think about yeah. stuff yeah. and break it down, and so I think that was Phillips kind of main thing is it was so second nature to him when he had to adapt to something different he 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 it was on you know it was on autopilot right yeah and that that's a big advantage and that comes with experience too i mean the more years you can do it for real you're going to start just mm -hmm. getting that awareness um so sim racing for me i've been a part of sim racing for like 15 20 years and i mean even to an extent going back in time you could call it a game and and now i'd make the argument that sim racing is truly a simulation What's your take on simulation and maybe how it's evolved over the years? Do you see it as a tool? I'm kind of getting in my head, ahead of myself, but what's your take on sim racing in general? I think it's, uh, I think it's a tool and uh, there's nothing that's quite the same as doing it as doing it. But I mean, certain parts of it are getting so good. I mean, it's sim racing is getting better all the time. You know, when iRacing came out with a new tire model that was much more accurate, it reminds me of when we started doing simulation for car development, when we first started, it was nowhere close, and so it really was useless. What this would say that would make the car faster would make the car faster. Right. But eventually, this got the digital model got better and better, and pretty soon, this started saying this will make the car faster, and it finally made the car faster. Right. And so I think simulation is 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 in that in that realm. The driving simulation is in that realm. Um, I mean, I know I, Oriol Servia was a tenant of mine, and and was above me, and I heard him, you know. You know, he was on. He was getting ready for Indy, uh -huh. and I heard him. He had his headsets on. I heard him, and he goes, "Will Power, is that you, Will Power?" Uh -huh. And he was he was on iRacing, uh -huh. running Indy, and right. Will Power showed up in his race. Right. Oh, and fantastic. And this was this was about four years ago. I don't think right. Power had raced Indy right too many times yet. And so, I mean, if those guys think it's it's useful, there's, there's clearly something to be Absolutely. gained from it. We met uh, Oriel, actually, we had a pretty competitive run with him, uh, mm -hmm. running sims head-to-head, -head, fighting for tenths of a second. Really good guy, great sim racer, too, Great by the guy, way. he's a good dude. Um, now, iRacing, for example, they put a lot of energy into scanning these tracks and getting this incredible realism. From what you've seen, have they gotten that kind of realism in the tracks? I mean, just looking at the tracks alone. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's funny, I was, somewhere recently and I, I and I looked over his shoulder and I mean literally in a second I knew oh that's where he's, you know it's, it's it's really right perfect every aspect yeah. of it and what about the cars uh, I haven't done enough to know you know I, I I people assume I've spent hours and hours and the funny thing is when just racing games started literally 20 some years ago on computers I deliberately stayed away from it because I said I will never make it through UCLA right. if I start, and I literally never went back to them. Right. And I'm 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 literally I'm be the one where I would I would be up all night and I would never stop. <laughs> and so now that I don't have well now I'm back to racing, but before I came back, there was no I, I probably could have become a, a sim racing recluse. Right. I, I will give some advice to sim racers just like I give to all young racers. Everybody's trying to get to where I got to. Absolutely. Which. I get, uh -huh. and it's great, and it's fun, and it, if you can make a living at it. But what I do now is not more fun than what I did the first year I did racing. And so everyone's so hell-bent on trying to get somewhere. 
I'm not sure you're going to have more fun than racing in your your iRacing league right. with the people you know and so forth. Right. And so it's it involves travel and real stuff and sexier real cars mm -hmm. and maybe getting paid. But I'm not sure it's it's more fun. Right. And right. So you know, don't let your obsession with trying to get somewhere and maybe not getting somewhere take the enjoyment out of it. Right. Because that's a it's about as good as it gets. Yeah. Well, I mean, how would you compare pro racing to like amateur racing? I mean, the guys who run amateur are just doing it for fun. There's yeah. nothing to be gained other than yeah. respect. Um, it's general. I mean, I would say it's not as much fun mm -hmm. because it's a job, mm -hmm. and I don't care what it is. The minute it becomes a job, it's not pure enjoyment. Right. You know, everyone that's at an amateur race is not only there because they want to be there, they probably are there through some significant sacrifice. Right. And and so and so every little bit you do, it's like it's you know it's like uh, people that you know wait all week to go get in the boat to go fishing or right. whatever it might be. Right. And I don't care what it is. The minute it becomes a job, there's some part of it that you're on someone else's, you know, you're accountable. There's pressure. You're in your head. You're thinking about it. If you don't do well, it affects you. You get right. stressed. You know, I, it's, a, it's as far as jobs go, yeah. it's the best. But it's a job. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're doing it for somebody else's reasons as much as your own versus an amateur's 100% for their own reasons. Yep. So uh, we talked about sim racing evolved. You've seen some of these kids who came through the GT Academy. You know, the hierarchy of racing in America, maybe you start off in carts or go to legends, depending on oval or whatever, and then move up the ladder. Do you see sim racing having a place in that ladder? I mean, could it be for, considered a form of motorsport? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, I think it's gonna continue to get bigger and bigger. I, I met a guy through the AMG uh, Driving Academy that is 65 years old, successful business guy, retired, has some money to go do it in real life, but that's not enough for him. He's, he's gotten into iRacing and he runs two or three nights a week on mm -hmm. iRacing and he's just totally obsessed. I mean, everybody that says, I wanna go racing, there's no excuse to not go racing. Right. Because, uh, you know, whether it's to go get a go-kart, and I just, I don't have time for people to say, you know, I just, I, I'm waiting for the opportunity. I said, we'll make it, you know? Right. And so there's no excuse. And people that really want to do it, it's like I hear actors and actresses, they say, oh, I just, I really, I love the craft. I just love it so much. I said, well, why don't you go perform in a play at your local playhouse? Right. Well, that's different. I said, no, it's not. No. It's, it's the craft. Yes. And so if you really like to drive, and it, some people say it's not the same as driving, and it, it's not the same yet. Right. But, if you like to challenge yourself and you like to be on the edge and you like to see how good you are, it has all of those components to it. So Absolutely. if you want to compete and, you know, it's, it's as hard to be really good at sim racing as it is at real racing. Right. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions for you. The next thing that kind of occurs to me, I think about using sim racing as a tool. Let's say that somebody is going to go to a new track they've never been to. iRacing obviously has a very nice layout. What kind of an advantage would that really be? I mean, I would think that most pro-level drivers have this ability to learn a track their first or second time around. So how much of an advantage would it really be getting really familiar with the layout prior to getting there in a real car? Well, like you said, I mean, when you get to a pro level, you learn tracks pretty quickly. But, I mean, the, the number of people in that basket isn't there aren't a lot of people that are like that. And even even a pro would benefit from having a little bit of muscle memory going before they got there. Right. Um, so, I mean, for anyone short of that, it would be invaluable. You right. Know, because um, you, you're st when you're still sort of working out, uh, when you're still working out what you're trying to do, it's not totally second nature to you. Mm -hmm. Laps are, are the, the, the number one thing that helps you. And right. So, uh, and, and it's one of those things when I was, first starting out, when I learned a track, I had to follow the fast guys to learn the fast way. Uh -huh. it, it was years before I could go to a track by myself and optimize for that track without watching and seeing. And even now, um, you think you, even when I got to that point, there's, you know, like having a fast teammate, you still are, benefit from getting feedback, from competing against other people, seeing where you're losing time, where you're gaining time. Right. And so it would be no different in, okay. that, in I racing. Um, now, one thing I think that'll be kind of universal between sim racing and real life racing, let's say you're at a track and you're a couple tenths off the pace. What do you do to look for that time? I mean, what, how do you approach when you just need to be faster mm -hmm. and obviously you gotta stay under control? How do you, what's your approach? Well, you gotta figure out where it is. I mean, that's the number one thing. And it used to be, 
there wasn't a great way to do that. When I started, the tool I had is I would, I would watch. And part of the fact, before I was old enough to drive, I was going to the race with my dad and I was taking pictures and I would, I would watch it as many corners as I could. I just watched and watched and, and you know what's fast, what's not. And so even when I started driving, I still employed that a lot. The minute I wasn't, like if my car ever broke, I immediately went out and watched my, my competitors do that. Or even it's helpful even to watch other classes of cars. And so, you know, the first thing is you got to figure out where it is. Right. And then, because a lot of times you think, oh, I'm losing time here and I'm fine here. And it's exactly opposite. Right. You're actually not as good as you think you are where you think you're good. And you're better than you think you are where you think you're bad. And right. So, and so if you don't really accurately identify where it is, you could mess up what you're doing well. And right. you could not be working on what you think you've got covered. So the first thing is figure out where it is. Right. Now with data and, and so forth, you, that isn't a mystery. So then it's a matter of, okay, now that I know where it is, then you see, is it, you know, corner entry, is it mid corner, is it out? And then you got to translate that into actual actions right. and break it down. And, and then even when you know what to do in theory, then you actually have to do it. Right. I think that's an area where sim racing actually has a one up on real life in that even the lowest rank sim racer has those tools available yep. like you wouldn't. I mean, we have all the, the data there. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned another thing that I, I, talking about looking at other drivers. Are you talking about from the side of the track, watching them? Are you talking about following them on track? Well, I'm, when I was talking about it, it was mostly outside the car. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it also applies, you know, the best thing you can do is follow the fastest guy. Right. And uh, in most amateur stuff, um, you just wait and, and you, you, you try to run with the quick guys. And even right. if they're a lot faster, you follow them for a little while and you learn some. Right. And, uh, and, and the same sort of thing is true, where we're, you know, all of a sudden you're like, wow, I'm not too far off the guys here. And you would have thought maybe you were. In other places, you don't think you are. And, right. Um, and the, the key is to not make excuses. And in sim racing, where there's the equipment is the same, mm -hmm. um, in real life, it's easy to say, that guy has got his engines from so-and-so. He's on these tires. He's got that engineer. And basically, it, some of it is true, maybe true, but half the time, it's not true. Right. And half the time, you're depriving yourself of the benefit of really saying what you're, you know, you're make, you're trying to make yourself feel better right. by not, I'm not just getting my butt kicked right. by this guy in this place. Well, you can't BS yourself around it. I mean, you got to be truthful you, you, if you're going to find it. You, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, last question for you, and I, I is totally off topic. I'd probably be upset if I. What's the favorite car you've ever driven? Favorite car I've ever driven. Um, different answers. I mean, the GTP cars were the ultimate thrill. Uh -huh. I mean, the cars were. 850 horsepower, 1,800 pounds, huge downforce, um, just brutes. Right. They were awesome. Uh, Trans Am car, in terms of the racing, you uh -huh. know, was 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 a great sort of package between. I mean, it's it resonated with fans. It also resonated with the drivers. They were a really fun right. era. The tires didn't last for 100 miles, so that was a big part of the science and the setup and figuring out. Right. And so that was that was a pretty. That was my favorite kind of racing. I right. Would say. Um, you've had a very very successful career. Any moment that really stands out as something just you, you'll never forget, just that prized moment in racing um, for you? I mean, I've had a couple. Uh, one weekend, you know, racing at the 24 Hours of Daytona with Paul Newman mm -hmm. in 1995. He was 70 years old. Uh, and I'd won it before with Roush, but to go there with a 70 year old actor right. who wasn't supposed to win and uh, to, to pull off the win, right. spend as much time with him as I did, that was a you know a special, you know, literally once in mini lifetime right. moment. Uh, you know, my win streak in 97 where we won all those races in a row, as that went along, that was pretty pretty cool. Right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and I appreciate just hearing some of your take on things. Glad to, glad to share it.